Good morning. Good morning. morning. My name is Alex Jules. I'm the historian for the Fellowship of Free Thought. It is December 18th, 2011. It's 11 o'clock. Um, do we have any visitors today? You don't have to get up, just wave so that we know. Hi. 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 All right. <clears throat> Tradition. A uh, tradition is a ritual belief um, or object passed down within a society, still maintained in the present with origins in the past. Miriam Webster defines it uh, as an inherited, established, or customary pattern of thought, action, behavior. Uh, the handing down of information, beliefs, etc., customs. Also, cultural continuity in social attitudes, customs, and institutions. Common examples include holidays or impractical but socially meaningful clothing, like uh, lawyer's wigs, military spurs, etc. But the idea has also been applied to social norms, such as greetings. Traditions can persist and evolve for thousands of years. The word tradition itself derives from the Latin tradere literally meaning to transmit, to hand over, to give. In the first definition, I want to call out what's underlined, though not verifiable. How many of you all put up uh, or decorate Christmas trees, trees in general? Yeah, okay, keep your hands up. How many of you do it as part of your Christian background or tradition, or former Christian tradition? Uh, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, okay. Uh, how many of you still put up trees and don't consider yourself Christian? Yeah, well, that's a lot, that's a lot. Okay, okay, the tree of course, traditionally a fir or pine, is more of a pagan symbol associated within winter solstice. The tree has nothing to do with the birth of a mythic savior born 2,000 years ago in a climate where the aforementioned trees would have a hard time ever even surviving but it's become part of the, this country's Christian tradition. The Yule Log uh, has frequently been associated with having its origin in the historical uh, Germanic paganism, which was practiced among, uh, across uh, Northern Europe prior to the Christianization of the area. Norse mythology recounts how the god Baldar was killed using a mistletoe arrow by his rival Hodder while fighting for the female Nana. Druid rituals use mistletoe to poison their human sacrificial victim. The Christian custom of kissing under the mistletoe is a later synthesis of some of the sexual license expressed during Saturnalia. Saturnalia, of course, as many of you know, is the actual pagan holiday that Christians deny celebrating in <laughs> December. So if you're a uh, pagan American, being told Merry Christmas, how would that make you feel? <laughs> or what if uh, you are one of the countless Christians that still believe that celebrating Christmas is a sin? Christmas was banned, right, by the Puritans, and um, its observance was illegal in Massachusetts uh, between 1659 and 1681, because of its pagan origins. And many sects do not celebrate it today. But we secularists still put up trees, exchange gifts, carefully planned chance encounters under the mistletoe, etc., all based on tradition, but with an understanding of tradition not shared by most. For us, it's something that's nice, or it's something that we've just always done within our extended communities. It holds no religious significance. Who wouldn't want, as a child, to experience waking up uh, to a beautiful decorated tree with gifts from Santa? Many traditions like these we remember with some semblance of uh, amicability, if not joy, unless you woke up too poor to have St. Nick stop by, um, or if you grew up <laughs> somewhere like Austria, where your memories of Santa <laughs> were intertwined with this guy. Right, so compass, right, is Santa's evil twin whose job is to beat and punish 
all the children who have misbehaved. On December 6th, men dress up in some of the scariest devil-like costumes you can imagine and drunkenly run around um, towns hitting people with sticks and switches. <laughs> Tradition, right. It, <laughs> the legend originates uh, in the Germanic Alpine region and is widespread throughout Hungary, Bavaria, Slovenia, and very popular in Austria. Traditions are not just what people pass along, but it's what they do. On one of my trips to a mosque a few months ago, I had the opportunity to ask uh, a few of the members, why do you think you walk around the Kaaba seven times? The only answer I could get was tradition. When I speak to Jewish friends who are secular, uh, what they did on their last trip to Israel almost always is, well, we went to the Western Wall and you know put a prayer in us. Like, you're a non-believer. And the answer that I get back is always tradition. In many cultures, considerable social pressure is brought to bear on families who resist conforming to the tradition of female circumcision. We laugh at our friends in Spain, Portugal, and Italy, where they set up a village of Bethlehem, along with Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus, and a caganera, right? or defecator, that's actually not the term, but I'm, that's, we have children in the room. Um, and, it, <laughs> and it's placed in the scene. Um, the Kaganer is a figurine traditionally of a man, usually politicians nowadays, uh, in the act of defecating. Right, pants around his knees, bending over with pile of feces at his heels. In fact, right, you can go to like malls and find huge, huge figurines or statues of Kaganeras, right? Uh, he is usually placed in the corner, perhaps because he needs his privacy. I don't know. So, um, also in uh, in places like Catalonia, right? This is a good one. Uh, the pooping log is a widespread Christmas tradition. It starts with the hollowed-out log, which is uh, propped up on four little legs, like sticks, and then painted to have a face. Every night, beginning December eighth, Cagatillo is fed and covered with a blanket so that he doesn't catch a cold. On Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, Cagatillo is put in the fireplace, beaten with a stick, and ordered to poop. <laughs> right. Uh, and then, of course, Norwegian legend says that on Christmas Eve, witches and evil spirits come out looking for brooms to ride, um, ride on, and it's a bad omen. So to thwart, to thwart the, the witches, all brooms in the house are hidden, and men go outside and fire a shotgun to scare the bad spirits away. <laughs> Tradition. <laughs> Traditions can seemingly be innocuous and some very funny, uh, but others are much more challenging, obviously, to morally reconcile. It's fine until somebody gets hurt, right? Many of us, many of the Christian traditions do come from the Alpine area, but deeper-rooted traditions can be traced back further to Roman pagans, right? So who first introduced the idea of uh, the holiday, excuse me, of Saturnalia, Saturnalia. And let's dig into that one a little bit more. It's a week-long period of lawlessness celebrated between December 17th and the 25th, a time where Roman courts were closed and Roman law dictated that no one could be punished for damaging property or injuring people during the week-long celebration. The festival began when Roman authorities chose an enemy of the Roman people to represent the Lord of Misrule. Each Roman community selected a victim whom they forced to indulge in food and other physical pleasures throughout the week. And at the festival's conclusion, December 25th, Roman authorities believed they were destroying the forces of darkness by brutally murdering this innocent man or woman. Tradition. Hence was tradition. Uh, I don't make a case for or against it, not really. I have my own. Uh, whether as non-believers, you know, we choose to make our own, adopt, or simply reason those away, tradition for us should be well-reasoned choices that we pass along to our seedlings, properly evolving into something more useful than its sometimes morose ancient beginnings. But as rationalists, the answer, because it's tradition, just as take it on faith should never be blindly accepted. 
We reject that as we reject dogma to illustrate or to remind us. To choose dogma and faith over doubt and experiences, to throw out the ripening vintage, and to reach greedily for the Kool-Aid. And we all know better. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. The Christians and the pagans. like to invite uh, <laughs> Jerry DeWitt um, to the podium. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Clergy Project. It is a project that was put together by, um, by uh, Dan Barker, who was a former minister. Yeah, I, I think we all know who, that, <laughs> who he is. And same thing with uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, and they put together a, um, a group to help, I, I want to say, recovering um, ministers or former ministers that have lost their faith, uh, lost their religion, um, deal with the complexities of life and losing their religion. We ha are honored today to have uh, one of their first graduates, uh, Jerry DeWitt, who's going to be talking to us. 
Thanksgiving versus to Boeing. I'm not expecting a call. This is how I'm timing myself with my phone. I am um, recently out of the ministry. As a matter of fact, I only went public um, in October was when I really went public. I preached my... Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't hard. Any fool can do it. All you have to do is be willing to totally screw up everything instantly and uh, throw away everything you've ever worked for in a moment's notice, and you can do it too. You can have this at no expense whatsoever. Um, so I preached my last message in April. I had struggled with belief for years, and I won't go into that story at the moment. Thank you for being so kind. You are very reflective of what I've experienced thus far. Lost my job December the 1st because of being publicly connected to the clergy project and to recovering from religion, which I'm now the non-paid, and you can make your checks out to P.O. Box 12, no. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm also over recovering from religion, um, started by Dr. Daryl Ray, who wrote The God Virus, if any of you, you're all familiar with that. Everybody always is. So, um, so let me tell you real quick about the clergy project. The pictures are the way they are for a particular reason. Uh, Dr. Dan Dennett started a study with researcher Linda Lascola a few years back. He was writing some books and discovered as he was interviewing different ministers, they would just begin to confess to him that they didn't believe and that they literally had stayed in the ministry for a lot of reasons. And the quickest way for me to explain it is how long do you stay in a bad marriage? How long do you stay in a bad relationship? It might be till the kids are grown or till you can afford your own house, which is kind of what ministers get trapped in. And they really are trapped, and I'm trying to put a human face to this very unique need that we face in the atheistic and humanist community. So Dr. Dan Dennett um, kicked this idea around for a while, and these three men, you see Dan Barker and, of course, Professor Dawkins, as they begin to communicate about this over a couple of years, finally, uh, Professor Dawkins said, let's just put our money where our mouth is. He sponsored the clergy project, which I think is pretty cool. And Dan Barker has become the face for it, and he actually runs it, staffs it, keeps it going. Now, basically, what this is, is this is a, a safe place for ministers on the Internet anonymously to communicate with each other. Because the questions that they're having to deal with are as large as we're dealing with this morning, such as what do you do with traditions, but they're also extremely large and complicated, like how will I make a living now when all I possess is a degree in theology? Or I haven't yet told my wife, what's a good way to break the news to my wife that we've spent 30 years trying to build a ministry only for me to no longer believe in the ministry at all? So that brings me to recovering from religion. I think that's really what we're all doing. And I think that's even if you've never been religious, even if you've never participated in church services, even if you weren't raised in a religious home, I think because of the shape that our nation has ended up in, I think we're all trying to recover from religion. Collectively, as a nation, we're trying to recover from religion. So this is an organization that I sponsor. And this organization just puts together little groups, 10 people at a time, to talk about their problems, talk about the similarities that they all suffer with. So obviously, traditions is one of them that we're trying to work out in these little groups. Is it okay to have a Christmas tree? Is it okay to celebrate Christmas? Now, I've been dealing with this only for a few months, so I have to really, I have to really take your advice in these things and lean on your wisdom and your experience. There's great leaders, and you know who they are in this assembly this morning. And so I have to take your advice. So really, I just want to come from my perspective for just a couple of minutes, if you'll allow me. We all see this now. This is making a lot of news on Facebook, making a lot of news on the news channels. And there's no doubt whenever Tim Tebow started doing this, there's no doubt that there was some sincerity there, that he really meant what he was doing. And he may still mean it as he does it today. But now it's taken on a different meaning. Now it's become customary. And now if he doesn't do it, it's going to mean something, right? Now, just as many people are watching to see, is he not going to kneel down and thank God when something happens? And, and, and <laughs> exactly. You think that's difficult, 
have a prayer line of about 100 people and 99 of them leave out with the same ailments that they had and the one who claims to be healed claimed to be healed last week and was in the line again tonight, then you'll know what it's like to try to thank God in hard situations. I've been there. So the situation that he faces is does he continue to make this gesture when maybe the heart isn't in it the way that it used to be? Does he continue to maintain this identity? Because obviously everyone would admit that's not the real Tim Tebow. That's just an image we have up on a screen, and that's a thought that we all think about him, but that's not the real him. He's, he's got complexities, and there's some, obviously some depth to his personality that we're not able to see in this two-dimensional representation. I would say to you that the situation that we're finding ourselves in is attempting to move beyond a collective identity and at the same time express our individuality. That's what free thinking is really about. And that's where all the trouble starts. I would say to you this morning that the whole world belongs to each and every one of us. And my small point of view, very young point of view in this would be, if you want to put up a Christmas tree, put up a Christmas tree if you like Christmas trees. Because that's your expression. That's who you are. And to not do it for any other reason other than you don't want to do it would be doing it for the wrong reason. Just like if he ever kneels down just because everybody expects him to kneel down. As a human being on this planet with a very limited space of time on this planet, he's got a right to kneel down or not kneel down based solely on whether or not he wants to. And I think that's what free thought is all about is doing it or not doing it because that's what you want to do. I, I'm coming from the point of view that, that what we're involved in and what we're doing is far more than just a war on religion. This, to me, is the continuation of the evolution of human intelligence, of progressive civilization, and of the expression of humanistic values. So it's not simple. It's not something that we can just write a code of ethics. That's the kind of things that we're trying to move away from. What we have to do is appreciate the uniqueness and the value of every single individual individually, not always collectively. What we do now, the very actions that we take and the people we are today will undoubtedly, whether we intend for it to happen or not, will become the traditions of the generation to come. They will look back on what we're doing and how we do it and how we handle ourselves and decide what they're going to do and what they feel obligated to do. I think we're all recovering from religion. And I think in recovering, we must begin to put all of the complex pieces of our lives into their proper priorities. We have to take each piece seriously. We've been given an opportunity. Do you understand this morning, and I know you do, I'm... I'm kind of preaching to myself for a minute this morning, if that's all right. Because I'm empty. I'm telling you, I am so drained from losing virtually every family member that I've had for the last 42 years. I know you didn't think I was that old, but it's the height that throws you off. <laughs> all the way to losing my job, I'm washed out. I'm completely washed away. This life that I've tried to build over the last 42 years has now been taken away from me for one reason and one reason only, because I dared to express my individuality. And that's what this is about. Whether a person is atheist who would object to your tree or whether a person is a free thinker or even a Christian who thinks it's hypocritical for you to have a tree, to hell with them. Because this is about individuality. I would say that one of the traditions that we should start extremely early would be that we should celebrate December the 15th, the day that Christopher Hitchens passed away. And we should call it Courage Day. We should call it something representing Christopher Hitchens. And from here on, we should hold that day in remembrance. Because the things that we're doing now are creating the landmarks and the memories for the generations to come. We're changing history. The greatest gift that you can give as a gift of appreciation to the life that you've been given is to be so thankful, so thankful for this precious moment that you've been given. 
Now that we no longer believe the fairy tales, we no longer believe that God had some great design and that all of this is about living for the future, we now know that it's about living for the moment. What we need to do as a community is express our thankfulness for this opportunity of being alive, somehow using traditions, if need be, as self-imposed timeouts because all of our lives are running on fast forward. If we can use our traditions like 1030, starting fellowship on a Sunday morning, if we can use that tradition not just to be part of the group, but also to stop and be thankful that our minds have been opened enough to be part of this group and that we're very aware of how special this moment is, if we can have those kind of traditions, then we will pass beautiful traditions on to the next generation. And can the congregation say amen? Amen. Thank you for your time. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, we have. Uh... How did you follow that? Up? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, there we go. Um, yeah, I left church for a reason. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so we have uh, Pachelbel's Canon in D. Are you going to? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with this little story. It's about this piece of music. It's a very popular piece of music. I'm sure you all know it, but I'll sing the melody right now. Just... Yeah, Pachelbel's Canon in D. It's a big hit in the classical world, and I know this because I'm a geek. I know what you're thinking. It's like, Rob, you can't be a geek. You play guitar. You're so cool. Okay, you weren't thinking that, but I was. Um... Well, I haven't always been this cool because I haven't always played guitar. I started out on the cello. Yeah, cello is a wonderful, beautiful instrument. It's a cool to be an adult that plays a cello. Being a kid that played the cello sucked. Because there's no way to be cool when your instrument is larger than you. When you walk to school with the cello, you're like a wounded gazelle on the Serengeti. Man. The bullies just smell you coming from a mile away. Ooh, I don't know what that thing is, but I know I'm going to break it. <laughs> But I put up with all of the abuse because I love the music that we played. I love everything we played in orchestra, except this. I hate Pachelbel's Canon in D with a passion. I hate it so much because the cello part is the worst cello part ever written in the history of cello parts. It's eight quarter notes that we repeated over and over again. They are as follows. D, A, B, F sharp, G, D, G, A. And that's all we got to play. We repeated those eight notes 54 times. I counted. Because I had nothing else to do. I would sit back and listen to the violins get lovely melodies. The violas would get lovely melodies. The second violins would get lovely melodies, which should just not happen. And the cello, we got stuck with eight crappy, lousy, stinking notes. And I began to wonder why. Why would Pachelbel do that to us? Such a beautiful instrument. And my theory was he once dated a cellist. And she dissed him really bad, and so for the rest of his life, he came up with the worst cello parts he could ever think of. It wouldn't be so bad if I didn't hear him every day. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Rob, don't listen to classical radio anymore. I, it doesn't matter. Pachelbel's following me. It sounds paranoid, but he's following you too. You hear him every day. I don't know, I went to my step-nephew-in-law's eighth grade graduation, and their graduation song was a song by Vitamin C. No. As we go on, we'll remember la da 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 so on the drive home, I turned on some classic rock, some Aerosmith. There was a time when I was so broken hearted. La da 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 da. So I got home, I thought I'd clear my mind with some folk music. No. Listen, children, to my story. It was written long ago. They do Paca Bell, just like everybody does Paca Bell, just to torment me. I don't even go to Taco Bell anymore because it sounds too close. <laughs> I hate Paco Bell with a passion. I don't even know his first name. It's probably Johan. They're all named Johan. When you think about it, he's the original one-hit wonder. 
He had one hit 300 years ago. It's my cross to bear my entire life. Where are they now? That's what I want to know. Where are you now, Paca Bell? VH1's I Love the 1790s. Where is it? And if he would just stay away from music that I loved, it would be better, but he won't. He is shameless. He will follow me to the ends of the earth. I went to Horde Festival thinking, no, he couldn't possibly follow me to the Horde Festival. But you know who's at the Horde Festival? Blues Traveler. So that means that Pachelbel was also at the Horde Festival. So, suck it in, suck it in, suck it in. Where you are in or inch and pin. Make it a spread move and then you're in. So I figure I'm going to listen to punk rock for the rest of my life. No dice. Do you have the time? To listen to me whine. You know I'm getting really bored. Cause all songs have the same damn chords. Punk music is a joke. It's really just baroque. Am I just paranoid? I wanna push you around, well I will, I will, I wanna push you down, well I will, I wow, it's been good living with you. And my machine head is better than the rest, my machine head is better than the... See the stone set in her eye, see the thorn twist in her... I'm all out of faith, this is how I feel, I'm cold and I'm shame, lying naked on the floor. He was a boy, she was a girl, could it be any more obvious, we're not gonna take it. No, we ain't gonna take it. On your market, say and go now. Got a dream and we just know now. No woman, no cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I find myself in times of trouble, Parker Bell's always following me. I'll see you in hell, Parker Bell. Oh, Parker Bell, Parker Bell. I'll see your ass in hell. I'll see you in hell, Parker Bell. Thank you so much, Penn State. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, now we're, we're going to hear from uh, Helen Frankel, uh, Lost in December Translation. Good morning. Um, this is only my second time here, so <laughs> I'm already here. So. Um, thank you. You know, I was just thinking this morning, um, I wasn't born in America. I came from another culture, and um, next year will make 20 years I've been in America. Just to think of the time stretch, you know. Um, most of my life I've been here. Didn't mean to give away my age or anything. So, um, and you know, the thing about it is that uh, the first year in America, you know, you're probably wondering, the name of the story basically refers to being lost in a different culture. And the, especially the first year in this country, I was horribly lost in American translation. And I don't even mean English to Russian or the other way. Um, if you think about it, most of the world is using, you know, Celsius degrees and kilometers and, um, you know, things like that. And so we were, we came here and it was Fahrenheit and it was miles and feet and... I mean, just to give you a brief introduction, um, my grandmother put something in the oven, she put it on 200 degrees, which in Celsius would bake very nicely, so... <laughs> I mean, an hour later nothing was happening, and then another hour, and then someone said, you know what, this is Fahrenheit, it's not right, so... And, um, and there's a lot of stories, but I mean, I remember I went to Subway and they asked me what sandwich I want. They said, would you like six inch or one foot? And I said, I'd like six feet. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's just because you don't really have orientation. It takes a while to switch uh, to different measures. Um, I remember being in Florida with my husband and telling my friends, those houses that we looked at in excursion, they were huge. I mean, it was 9,000 square miles. And... The what? <laughs> oh, you mean to say feet, right? So, you know, it's things like that. But um, one of the things that was also very different that uh, I came from the culture where you really never talked about God and people were in charge of their life pretty much and to the culture where, you know, we're going to pray for you and um, the Christmas play at the church is more important than a child's birthday party or something like that. So... 
Uh, it was a lot of things to get used to. And so this story, Lost in December Translation, um, a little exciting thing. Uh, I've been writing 30 years, and uh, this is the first time ever in my life. It's going to be published in the January issue of Dallas Writers' Journal. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so um, this story is not new to my friends. Yet in my 19 years living in the United States, it never fades in its crispness, bright and confusing emotions. We're only given our childhood once, and a memory of traditions and culture you were exposed to as a child, you carry with you for the rest of your life. So growing up in the Soviet Union, where religion was dropped out from the society, forbidden and ridiculed, there was no such thing as Christmas. There was no God. There was the Communist Party. They were the God. Well, at least that's what they wanted people to believe, in a sense. And yet, everyone needs a festive winter holiday. So we had New Year. Not in the sense that Americans have it, in an American Christmas sense. We did trees, decorations, gifts, Father Frost, also known as Santa Claus, in US, and we had huge immeasurable celebrations all over our immense country on December 31st Eve, New Year's Eve. All the energy and traditions uh, that Americans put into Christmas, uh, we did the same on New Year. It was a magical holiday with wishes come true, fortune telling, staying all night till early morning, 6 a.m. or so and uh, celebrations and just everything you could think of. It was and is today my favorite holiday. It was kind of like Christmas without religion attached to it. And at the same time, I had a vague notion that I was Jewish. Being Jewish was not a good thing to be in the former USSR. It was something you hid from people the best you could to avoid being denied a job, being harassed, if not physically, and persecuted in other ways. The religious practices of Jewishness were banned even more so than any others. And at times, as a child, I was ashamed of being a Jew, which made my mom brokenhearted. Um, so growing up as secular as I am today, the term Jewish meant ethnicity, something that is marked in your passport, much like being French or Irish. That does get many Americans confused when I say I don't do Shabbat or don't go to synagogue and they say you're Jewish. So, um, so back to December. When we came to US, it was as political refugees, as persecuted Jews. So, of course, Jewish Family Service tried to teach us Jewish traditions and holidays the ones that I never knew or experienced as a child. And one of them was, of course, that Christmas is not our holiday. Uh, that concept becomes overwhelmingly confusing to me every year once the first decorations appear in the mall and holiday songs start playing on 103.7 FM. <laughs> I mean, no matter what I tell myself, I genuinely love the Christmas stuff, the decorated trees, the festive mood, all the beauty of this holiday. Sometimes I sing it, its tunes and I think of gifts, tree toys, events around town. I feel part of it. Part of what? My mind thinks New Year. I associate everything in town around me in December was my favorite, happiest holiday of my life, the one on December 31st. Where does it get so confusing? It's not that to American culture. Why am I even kidding myself? Their holiday is Christmas. How do I fit in as I share all the same passions, emotions, and feelings as my fellow Americans, yet I don't, feel the bill, don't fit the bill? As each year comes to an end, I get lost in December translation. People wish me Merry Christmas. Part of me wants to say, I'm Jewish, we don't have Christmas. We have Hanukkah. Another part of me thinks, man, I love this holiday. <laughs> 
this is my thing too. Oh no, I'm not supposed to sing this. This is wrong. This is not right for a Jew. And round and round we go. And the funny story of many years ago that still makes me laugh, and people I tell it to, it was, it was close to a Christmas day, and an employee at a gas station said the usual Merry Christmas to me, and tired of going into details, I simply replied, Merry Christmas. As we got talking, we found out that he was a Muslim and I was Jewish. <laughs> Um, you know, people often ask me, so, have you done your Christmas shopping? This question gets me so lost. I never had that concept in my life, yet I realized that this holiday is the most special to them, and I feel an enormous respect for how it is to these people. So not wanting to offend their holiday spirit, I start comprehending the right way to reply. So to answer, I do New Year shopping, uh, would sound to them like I'm speaking French. I mean, it does sound confusing because, after all, they didn't grow up in the USSR. So, then my son starts asking, uh, starts telling me what he wants for Christmas, as he hears it from other kids, and it all spirals from there, being non-standard, so to speak, for the lack of more politically correct word, society member. So, as I delightfully breathe in a fresh, crispy smell of Christmas trees, as I admire beautiful tree toys, look at the magnificent beauty around me, and my heart is filled with the warm glories, holiday spirit, love, and joy, I reply to the cashier at Walmart who says to me, Merry Christmas, with the same phrase that I've learned to use my 19 years living in America, Happy Holidays. <laughs> and, um, just to finish this on a humorous note, I will confess this awful secret to you. Uh, <laughs> between Christmas and year, there's about five, six days. So some of the poor Russian immigrants that just came to this country, uh, they noticed that some Christians throw away the Christmas tree very soon, like December 26th, 27th. And so they go around and look in the street. And I mean, you can't beat that price, you know, you get... Um, <laughs> You, you get your tree for New Year's Eve, and um, then many you know, holiday items also go on sale, become half price off or something. And I mean, I do want to apologize that we take advantage of American tradition. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll have the Faithless Companions up again. Let the mystery be. I think that's going green. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. 
Okay, so what's really interesting about Saturnalia is that uh, originally, um, that's actually where we get the idea of caroling from. But the way that they would do it um, when they were, you know, having fun was they would go caroling from house to house, but they did it naked. So just an interesting <laughs> fact. <laughs> hey, who's our next? <laughs> Let me get the mic ready for you there, Dalin. <laughs> yes, I am a, uh, uh, yes, nudist, <laughs> one might say. Um, also, my printer uh, ink uh, kind of ran out, so if you see me looking really close. <laughs> All right, uh, whenever I hear, hear the word tradition, my mind immediately starts playing the opening song from Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> yes, and um, all right. So that is actually a really great movie. It's three hour playing time, and the fact that it's a musical about Russian Jews can be fairly off-putting to some people. <laughs> but it's actually a very good movie uh, with an even better message. Pretty much everything in their lives is run by tradition. Uh, what they wear, who they marry, how they love, their daily life, and any deviation from this tradition is met with scorn or disdain from everyone in the community. Uh, the main character in the movie, Tevye, has daughters who continue to find ways to go against tradition, break these traditions, and um, it's much to his chagrin. Um, his immediate reaction to all these is anger, and he fights to maintain his hold on how things are supposed to be. Um, ultimately, though, in every case, he ends up relenting because he realizes that these traditions, in most cases, are based on dogma, and in some cases, he can't even really figure out why they do them. Like, they, there's no reason. He can't even, you know, find the source for it. So. He doesn't have a hard, as hard a time letting go. <clears throat> when I first watched this movie, it wasn't until well, I was in my late 20s, and I was already, you know, uh, uh, coming to terms with the fact that I'm gay and how I was going to come out to my parents. And as I was watching this movie and seeing, you know, his reaction to what he considered unacceptable and you know he goes on rants and this is not permissible it's unacceptable and i was thinking when this movie's over i need to come out of the closet to my mother <laughs> <laughs> because she was sitting there watching it with me <laughs> of course i wasn't brave enough to do it then but i eventually did a few years later and uh, when i came out of the closet and i left the church I pretty much abandoned most of the traditions that I had, uh, that had been instilled in me since birth. It was that uh, I entered into a spirit of re-examining everything I had been told and taught to, you know, evaluate whether there was some merit or there or not. Um, and it's in these times of, you know, end of the year, holiday, happy holidays, and Merry Christmas that. Uh, those of us who have cast off the traditions of our past, um, we find ourselves in a quandary over what's worth keeping and in, if anything. Um, growing up, there were many holiday rituals and traditions we observed in our family. Uh, some of them I dreaded, and I only went through, uh, went through with them because they had to be endured in order to get to the good ones. Um, one of these is putting up the Christmas tree, which whether it's a real tree or a fake tree, you're gonna get stabbed, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, once the tree was up, you had to decorate it, which meant hooks and ornaments and more stabbing. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, that was all the preparation for the kid that, or the thing that every child knows is important, getting presents. <laughs> of course, um, the parents were always trying to make it be about Jesus. <laughs> but really, kids don't care about that. <laughs> they just want the presents. We just went along, you know, we acted out the manger scene while our dad read the, you know, Bible story from Luke 2 of 
you know, how the wise men came from the east and whatnot, and, you know, we acted out. And um, one year we had a baby Jesus who was uh, rather uncooperative, as she, had be, as she was two years old at the time, and uh, <laughs> got up and uh, walked around. And <laughs> But uh, so I think Christmas really stopped being fun for me when the presents stopped being fun. Um, you know, as you get older, it's harder to shop for you. So you get things like socks and sweaters and uh, shirts and stuff you could really go out and buy for yourself anyway. Um, and now I... Uh, I don't know how proud I should be to admit this, but I really don't do any Christmas shopping. I'll, uh, I'll maybe get one thing for one person that's on my assigned list, and uh, then I consider myself done. I guess I've become Ed Ebenezer Scrooge, although I never did really see what was so bad about him. He seemed rather <laughs> practical to me. <laughs> And although the holidays don't actually mean that much to me anymore, it does make me happy to see other people be happy. So really what the, uh, the tradition that I like to carry on is to do things for other people at this time of year. Uh, last month in the gathering when they were talking about the volunteering events and um, all the different activities that uh, the fellowship does, I realized I had been absent from most of them. And so that brings me to another New Year's, or uh, another tradition of New Year's resolutions, which I always, you know, considered that kind of um, dubious in that I'm of the mindset where if you need to improve yourself, you should do that all year round, not just at New Year's. But uh, that is one New Year's resolution I'm making for myself this year is to participate more in our community events. So. <laughs> I hope people will join me, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Ah, uh, humble. All right. Uh, <laughs> and now, uh, examining our own traditions with Justin Fisher. So we've heard a number of different traditions that people have talked about having and uh, ones that people have left behind and some others uh, that people have thought about setting as new traditions for themselves. And so what we'd like to do now is actually give you all an opportunity to uh, share some of the traditions that uh, either you've uh, decided you want to abandon, traditions that you've decided that you want to keep, um, perhaps mutations that you've done to various traditions um, or new traditions that you hadn't seen other people do but decided to start for yourself. So we'd like to hear you talk about that. Just to get us started, I'll share one that uh, Tammy and I do ourselves. So uh, we uh, followed the old pagan tradition of uh, putting evergreens in the house to symbolize life even in the heart of winter. Um, and uh, I guess we kept the sort of tr Christian aspects of having it be a whole tree and uh, putting lights on it. Um, but uh, the sort of mutation we've done to it, which is hard for you to see, but uh, we uh, have a bunch of birds on our tree, which we think of as Darwin finches, which symbolizes for us the uh, sort of quest for knowledge and recognizing what our true origins are. So we have our own sort of mutated version of a, of a holiday tree that we put up. Um, and uh, also our cats really enjoy it, which... <laughs> Great. So let's uh, open this up now. I'd like to encourage uh, people from the audience. Yeah. Um, my daughter likes to cook, and so I thought it was a very cheap kind of present at this time of year that um, you know to, to, to give her like she likes like, like the cookies in a jar and those kinds of things. You know that actually gets her really excited. But it occurred to me that maybe the flying spaghetti month for this year might bring her some pasta and some sauce, and she can make her own. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Um, well, this will only be my second Christmas as an atheist, but um, <laughs> so I'm still trying to figure out exactly what I want to keep, what I don't want to keep, but I, I like putting up Christmas lights, so I'm still going to keep doing that. I'll, I'll leave the angel, you know, <laughs> and, but, you know, I'll still do the Christmas tree. I'll probably do something like that, or I heard people do the tree and all those kind of things, but I like Christmas lights. They're cool. Like, <laughs> 
Yeah. Carol? He's talking about his, this second, second Christmas is an atheist. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see the XKCD cartoon this week? The tradition for the baby boomer generation. Oh, yeah. Is there anything you've done more than one? <laughs> 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 Jamie? that I'm going to keep alive now that my daughter's born, of making hand prints and putting hand prints and cutting them out of poster board and covering them with glitter. So our family trees have the hands of all of our family members going back over 50 years now. And uh, as we grew up, you have a hand from every year and you have your, your name and the, the year on the back. But we have literally thousands of these hands that my family has had. And uh, this year will be our first year to have glitter hands on our Christmas tree. <laughs> Other people? Yeah, Melanie. Uh, about nine years ago, I made the decision to um, have the tradition of not participating in family drama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's just one quick thing. In Russia, um, on New Year's Eve, when the clock strikes midnight, you can make a wish and it's supposed to come true next year, but they don't give any money back guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yep. We have a thankful tree. A thankful tree. Ah, good. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I think that's uh, a good one to end on. Uh, happy Festivus or whatever traditions uh, you choose to celebrate uh, this year. Um, now we have a, a couple other things. Um, I think uh, first up on a more somber note, uh, Zach's going to do an in, in memoriam for us. Yeah, so um, as was uh, previously mentioned, um, we lost Christopher Hitchens uh, three days ago to esophageal cancer. Um, that he'd been battling with for um, a couple of years. And uh, many of us have had um, our experiences with him. He, uh, he got around quite a lot and, and spoke in many places. Most recently spoke uh, in Dallas at the Prestonwood Academy event where he debated um, William Dembski. And many of us went there to see him and cheer him on. Um, Unfortunately now his, uh, his voice is silent and his pen has um, been laying still. Um, he would not want us to be just undying fans of his. Um, he didn't want that. Um, but what he, what he himself wrote and said um, was that he, he very much enjoyed the ability to remember the people who had passed on by recalling their words and the things that they had written. So. Um, in honor of, of Hitchens, I wanted to read a section of um, 
His closing statement at the Prestonwood debate, which I felt really encapsulated well um, his, his message to us all. He said, uh, when Socrates was sentenced to death for his philosophical investigations and for blasphemy and for challenging the gods of the city, and he accepted his death, he did say, well, if we are lucky, perhaps I will be able to hold conversation with other great thinkers and philosophers and doubters too. In other words, that is the discussion about what is good, what is beautiful, what is noble, what is pure, and what is true that could always go on. Why is that important? Why would I like to do that? Because that's the only conversation worth having. And whether it goes on or not after I die, I don't know. But I do know that it is the conversation I want to have while I am still alive. Which means that to me, the offer of certainty, the offer of complete security, the offer, the offer of an impermeable faith that can't give way, is an offer of something not worth having. I want to live my life taking the risk all the time that I don't know anything like enough yet, not anything like enough yet, that I haven't understood enough, that I can't know enough, that I'm always hungrily operating on the margins of a potentially great harvest of future knowledge and wisdom. I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'd urge you to look at those who tell you, those people who tell you at your age that you are dead until, they be, until you believe as they do. What a terrible thing to be telling to children. And that you can only live by accepting an absolute authority. Don't think of that as a gift. Think of it as a poisoned chalice. Push it aside, however tempting it is. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Thank you. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> so we will, we will remember Hitchens. And now um, the Free Thought Kids with Amanda Jules. Okay, um, just a couple of quick things. We actually have expanded our kids group. We now have um, about three months to two years. I'm taking care of in the gym, um, then two to six and then our seven to 13, 14 year olds. And we're now 14 and above is going to be in here from now on, because they kind of, at that age, they get a lot more in here, and in there they t kind of tend to get bored. So um, we split up, so we now have four going, because with the seven to 13, they do one science class, one critical thinking class, and they switch, and so they've actually got both. So we have four classes going now. So they're gonna tell you what they did in the older class. We actually did not have any little ones today, but we had about 15 seven to 14 year olds today. And Ryan is going to do a demonstration of um, what they did in the science class. Okay, put the microphone on there. I got to go. Okay, you can hold it for me. Okay. So, basically, this is pretty cool. What you do, you start with three loops, put at 90 degrees angles, and you cut down the middle of each of them, and you get two rectangles. I will now explain exactly how this is possible. <laughs> so, you cut down the first loop, the orange one, and it becomes like this. You then cut down the yellow one, and we've got this. Finally, you cut the third one, the red one, and you've got two rectangles. Because I used different colors, you can see exactly which came from which loop. This was the red loop, and this was the yellow loop, and this was the orange loop. Okay, this is getting kind of tangled. Ah! And like that.
they did some other stuff, but I didn't teach that class. So you're you're having to rely upon what they tell you now. Um, but basically, with the um, its angles, if you tape the circles together differently at 60 versus 90 degree angles, and cl cut through the center of the circles, you'll get different shapes. And she's going to explain what they did in the critical thinking class in regards to traditions. We talked about the traditions of Christmas. My favorite tradition is always opening one present on Christmas Eve. And we found out that um, in Australia, they celebrate Christmas in summer. We figured he might, that Santa might be wearing a bathing suit, not a jacket. <laughs> And they mostly have barbecues and trade presents, and yeah, <laughs> that's all. You can ad lib the rest in there. Um, now, since we do have four classes and so many kids, and I know we have a lot of new people coming in, but we also have a lot of people that come continuously, I've noticed that RSVPs for kids are not being done for the kids that do come. I still need to know if your child is coming because I need to buy supplies. I don't want to buy 15 and 17 kids show up and two kids can't participate in something, but also don't want to have to buy a lot and have to return it the next day because we didn't have that many kids. So if you do have kids coming, please RSVP at least three days out. Even if you're a high maybe, that's okay. I can buy a couple and reuse it later, but having no idea, like right now we had nine kids RSVP, I have 15 in the classroom. And also for teachers, that's a really big thing to help me out. So please, if you have kids coming, RSVP for that. Thank you. Zach, did you have any announcements? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah. So next, uh, our, our gathering next month, uh, it's still kind of tentative. We've, um, we're unfortunately, we're losing this location here. Um, there's a church that's gonna be taking it over. So we're, we're looking at other locations, and the one that we have penciled in for next month is Samuel Grand Rec Center, which is down a little bit closer into downtown Dallas. Um, and of course, stay on, on the meetup site, and if you're connected to us on Facebook, that's where you can get the information. Um, so just watch that there. And also, um, the, uh, I just want to let you guys know, you know, as the end of the year comes and you want to make, start making some charitable donations, of course, uh, remember the FOF, we are a 501c3 organization, so by all means, you know, remember us as the end of the year approaches and you want to get as much of a tax benefit as you can. Um, the money that we use goes to, goes to rent, renting facilities like this, uh, paying for our children's supplies, um, buying new equipment, and, and basically everything that you see us doing helps supporting all of our activities. Um, also, if you are, if you look at your, your bulletin, uh, remember the DFW Coalition of Reason um, is currently uh, fundraising for their next advertising campaign. So uh, we want to uh, have the funds necessary to um, to make a few people in town upset a little bit and <laughs> and keep on pushing the message that we are here and we are good people and we deserve as much respect and, and recognition as everybody else. So go to dfwcore.org and make your donation there. So that is, I think that's it. Are there any other announcements, Jamie? Okay. Any, Emily? Yeah, hockey, game. hockey game, yeah. So check, don't forget to check on the inside of your bulletin. It's got a list of all the activities coming up later this month and also in January. So the Texas Tornado hockey game is on Friday, January 6th in Frisco. We had a great time last year. Yeah, there's flyers on the back too, and there's hockey if you want to order. And there's, there's flyers in the back. Is there one for the game on the one as a group? Okay. And I should.
also announce that um, uh, announcement regarding uh, new members. Uh, so we have uh, confirming Catherine Leon as a new voting member of our group. Welcome, Catherine. Um, and if anybody else is interested in becoming a voting member, which will be necessary, of course, for our spring elections, I have forms up here if you're interested. Um, starting in January, if you uh, registered as a member last year, that will need to be renewed. So keep your, uh, watch your email inbox for renewal notices, because everyone will have to renew just to read up um, in order to uh, participate in the elections next year. Okay, anything else? Well then, have a happy holiday season, whichever holiday you're celebrating, Krampusnacht, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever, and um, let's have a good potluck. See you next month. <laughs>